In this video, we are going to look at some of the key anatomical features of the human heart. And we're going to do so by using this lovely animation here of a beating heart that you can access on the BioDigital software. I don't work for BioDigital or anything, but I just think it's a nice image. Uh, and we are going to combine that with this cross-sectional view <coughs> Uh, through the frontal plane, so uh, that's basically separating if you or if you were to take a heart and cut it, separating front from back, anterior from posterior. This is the posterior section we have here, uh, so that we can see some of the internal structures that we wouldn't otherwise be able to view. Uh, now there is rather a lot of subject specific terminology, and I will also create after this video in a separate folder uh, a a sort of cardiovascular dictionary, if you like, um, which if you find yourself getting a bit bogged down in some of the terminology that I'm using, um, it may be useful for you uh, to refer to so that you uh, know exactly what we're talking about. Where I can, I will use some of the uh, tags that have been made in with, or put in with the software. So for example, here, if you click on my ear water, it highlights the aorta but it doesn't separate it into sections uh, so we have three sections of the aorta here which we'll discuss it also includes these three blood vessels as part of the aorta which they are not we will talk about each one of those separately as well uh, so there we are we will work with what is still a very good piece of software I feel So in order to do this, we are going to imagine turning from the pulmonary circulation, so it's freshly oxygenated blood, and I'm trying to get a view of the atrium here where the aorta isn't in the way. Sort of there, I suppose. Um, we'll go with that. Maybe if I did, no. We'll stick with that. Um, and it's going to enter into the left atrium here and go on from there, basically. Uh, so... Um, Let's begin. Uh, so as we said, our freshly oxygenated blood is going to enter the left atrium by one of the four pulmonary arteries. We have two here on the left. No prizes for guessing which lung this receives oxygenated blood from. It's the left lung. And two here from the right. These are the right pulmonary arteries which receive oxygenated blood from the right lung. Uh, if you Click here, we see this in the left atrium. It also includes the vessels as part of the uh, image, but there we go. We work with what we have. Uh, the left atrium is separated from its neighbour, the right atrium, funny enough, uh, by a thin wall, a intra a inter atrial septum we can't see it really we can sort of you know, not in this image um, but there is an interatrial septum uh, we will talk about the interventricular septum later on uh, but it separates the oxygenated blood in the left atrium from the deoxygenated blood in the right atrium uh, some of you may have also noticed these rough pouch-like structures here on the anterior aspect of the two atria. Uh, these, I should point out, are not separate chambers. They're not the fifth and sixth chamber of the heart. They are a continuation of the atrium, but they are structurally different. Uh, these are known as oracles. So here we have the left oracle. and may as well show you the right which is there uh, they are so named because apparently they look like dog's ears um, which I guess I can see but I can't imagine being an early cardiovascular anatomist and cutting a heart to pieces and thinking oh yes dogs at the same time who knows maybe I'm just not being very imaginative but there we go uh, these are oracles. The function of the oracle, I should say, is, uh, I'm sure you can imagine, to increase the volume and the capacity of the atrium uh, to simply allow it to take in more blood uh, 
uh, from its respective circulatory system. So let's move over to our other image. Now our blood that we're tracking is the right atrium. This is similar between the two, uh, what we're going to talk about, uh, but you can see the structure or the structures, oh, whoops, a daisy, uh, that I'm going to talk about better here. So the posterior portion of the atrium, uh, the wall of the atrium is very smooth. Uh, but as you move anteriorly, and into the oracle, we see here a more rigid lining to the atrium. Uh, now we tend to think of the heart as having uh, cardiac muscle tissue and that that's just one muscle tissue uh, in and of itself, but there are different variations of cardiac muscle tissue uh, and this is one of them. Uh, this is pectinate muscle tissue. Uh, I can't click on this and highlight it so it will very much be in the dictionary. Uh, but this is pectinate tissue. Uh, it's found only in the atria. Uh, you won't find this in the ventricles. Uh, it's actually helpful viewing this in the right atrium because uh, it has more uh, pectinate muscle tissue and they're larger whereas the left atrium has fewer and they are smaller. Uh, and they continue all the way in to the oracle, as I say. Well, it's possible, it's possible. Um, but that doesn't really get forced in to the ventricles below from the atria. It's sucked in from the ventricular contraction. So the ventricle sucks blood down from the atrium, it doesn't have it really forced in, but it's possible, it's possible. It's a hard subject to study. Anyway. Oh, hang on, let me pause whilst I orientate my heart. Two atrioventricular valves, which we can see here. This is the first here, and the other is over here. We'll come on to that later on. Um, and they are so named because they separate the atrium from uh, the blood in the atrium from the ventricle. These valves respond really to changes in pressure uh, in the heart as it contracts and relaxes to prevent a backflow of blood by closing. Uh, so this will allow blood into the ventricle and will prevent uh, by opening and will prevent the backflow of blood by closing. cusps open and then come back together again. The atrioventricular valves here and here are tethered, if you like, via these cords. Uh, traditionally these were known as the heart strings. Um, so if you said you, if someone was to die of a broken heart due to some emotional strife, uh, it was said that it's because these uh, cords had separated and therefore they uh, the heart couldn't function properly and they had a broken heart. Don't know how much truth is in that, but these are more anatomically accurately known as the chordae tendinae. Uh, the chordae tendinae. Uh, and they are present on both the atrioventricular valves. Uh, they tether the cusps of the valve to a, another type of muscle called papillary muscle we see here which acts as a tethering point. 
point for the chordae tendineae, of course. The cusps of the valve are forced open to allow blood to flow into uh, the ventricle uh, and the chordae tendinae are relaxed, they are slack. Um, however, during ventricular systole, so the ventricles are contracting, uh, the purpose of the chordae tendinae is to prevent a prolapse of the valve, so pre to prevent the valve uh, opening in the opposite direction if you can imagine so the valves fold inwards uh, during uh, atrial systole but during ventricular systole uh, the valves would fold outwards into the atrium were it not for the chordae tendinae so the chordae tendinae prevent this prolapse uh, of the valves and allow the blood to pass in uh, up or up in up past the aortic valve which we see here and we'll come on to in a second. So it's worth quickly discussing, actually let me get in position first. There we are, the respective ventricular septum, and on this side we have the right ventricular, the two walls, and this isn't just because the cut has been made in a certain place, it's very much the case. So on average, uh, the left ventricular wall is somewhere between 10 to 15 millimeters in thickness uh, whereas on the right side the ventricular wall is about four to five uh, millimeters in thickness uh, if you're interested the I think of adaptations to exercise and when you start reading around different research articles the majority of the research out there focuses on changes on or in the wall thickness in response to exercise or even the lack thereof uh, so this is what the bulk of the research focuses on. There are a few studies out there that have started to look at the right ventricular wall, uh, but primarily we're looking at changes in the left ventricular wall thickness or even the volume of the ventric or the capacity, I should say, of the ventricular or left ventricle. Uh, a bit of trivia, I suppose, about the interventricular septum um, were this cut made more anteriorly you see that the ventricular septum isn't of a uniform thickness as you see here this is a bit misleading um, the superior portion of the septum is much thinner as made of connective tissue where, and it's in this thinner region at the atrium of the septum uh, where we sometimes see or what we would refer to as a connective tissue doesn't seal properly during fetal development and allows oxygenated and deoxygenated blood to mix in together basically between the two ventricles uh, which is going to cause a range of different conditions. Right. Uh, oh, uh, and some of you may may be wondering what these twiglet-like structures are here at the bottom of the two ventricles. Uh, these are yet another type of cardiac muscle tissue, uh, but these are exclusively found in the ventricles. Uh, these are known as trabeculae carne, um, and they serve a role that is, if we were talking about skeletal muscle tissue. 
a synergistic role. So they're, they're not the agonist muscle like the bicep, they're more like the brachialis in terms of elbow flexion. So the biceps brachii facilitates. And they also support the papillary muscles. So they're, they're there to lend a hand, basically. Um, but that's what these little twiggity structures are here. It is cardiac muscle tissue, but it is called trabeculae carne. Anyway, uh, in ventricular systole, the blood is going to be ejected out of the left ventricle via the aortic valve. Uh, we have two semilunar valves, and unfortunately we can't see the other one. You're going to have to imagine it, or I'll put another image up. Um, and this is one of them. So we have two atrioventricular valves here and here, and we have two semilunar valves. And this is the first, the aortic valve. information um, the aorta at this point is divided up into sections which isn't labeled unfortunately but the first five centimeters or so of the aorta having uh, left the heart now so we're in, now in the vascular system um, or the systemic system specific uh, freshly oxygenated blood is sent to the lower extremities now then we have three blood vessels here as we mentioned earlier and we will discuss these from left to right. So on the left, here, there we go, it's a bit of view. Uh, we have the brachiocephalic artery and Whenever you hear the term cephalic, uh, that's going to be in reference to the neck and head. Um, and funny enough, that's where the blood that is being injected from the ventricle and ends up going through the brachiocephalic artery goes. It goes via the neck up to the head and the right arm. Um, the next in line here, the middle artery we see there. Uh, this is the left common carotid artery. This is also going to send blood uh, to the head via the neck. Um, the, and the head, so the two are from left in the middle, the brachiocephalic and the left common carotid are sending blood to the head. Uh, the brachiocephalic also sends blood to the right arm and the uh, left subclavian sends blood to the left arm. And then the aorta is going to send blood down to the lower extremities. So off around the systemic system. So back in our cross-sectional view, uh, we assume all has gone well, blood has circulated around uh, the uh, 
systemic circulation, our oxygen has been removed, we are now full with the byproducts of metabolism and the deoxygenated blood is being returned to the right atrium here and is going to enter via these two large vessels. These blood vessels here are those. Okay, a bit of an extreme close-up, but uh, our deoxygenated blood is going to enter the left, uh, sorry, the right atrium, which we've discussed the anatomy of previously, um, and is then going to pass into the right ventricle via our second atrioventricular valve, which is the tricuspid valve. Again, tethered by the chordae tendinae, uh, tricuspid valve, so named because, um, perhaps you can guess, uh, it has three cusps uh, to it when it opens. Um, I should add the uh, semilunar valves uh, have three cusps each. Oh, cusp, the cusps each. What we testify? Go here. And it is going to be ejected upon ventricular systole via the pulmonary valve which unfortunately we don't have an image of but you just have to imagine it's more or less the same as the aortic valve here just it separates uh, the right ventricle uh, or blood in the right ventricle from the pulmonary trunk which is this blood vessel here, pulmonary trunk. Now, again, the software highlights this whole section as being part of the pulmonary trunk. It's not quite accurate. Uh, the pulmonary trunk uh, is this first section here, but where it starts to branch off, uh, we have the left on the right and the right, which goes just underneath the aortic arch, uh, pulmonary arteries. So they're going to send deoxygenated blood all the way back to the lungs in order to uh, be reoxygenated and the cycle repeats itself. So there we are. Uh, so as I say, may need to watch this video more than once um, because again, there's a lot of terminology that we've covered, but um, we will now be moving on to the vascular system, so looking at the blood vessels themselves specifically.